uh, <laughs> it's 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 uh, yeah. So it's it's very positive. Yeah, and they, they should all feel very encouraged about the, getting this feedback from such a distinguished audience. Yeah. Okay. Um, I would say um, we should skip again, as was planned, the, uh, the, our buffer break, and then uh, move directly to the next uh, presentation, um, which is uh, innovative trial design by Franz König. There has been a, 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 a problem in communication because our messages landed in his uh, spam mailbox, uh, but we, we found out about this, I think, earlier today. And so I'm very happy now that this seems to be working. And um, well, we have, I mean, there is some concept. I think uh, uh, it's, it's a bit hard to see it behind this the structure of the symposium. And everyone, I think, has seen the importance of clinical trials and, um, and also the importance of doing clinical trials different from the past. I mean, uh, and uh, in, a, in a recent workshop of the European Medical Agency, well, we, we, had, we were both, I think, in a, in, a, in a working group or in a conference, and we had the impression, or I had the impression, it's going to be very interesting to see uh, what kind of ideas and concepts have been used or are, are in development in Vienna. And so I hand over to um, Franz Koenig to talk about innovative trial design that may help us for, for, for the future in, in COVID-19 or, or pregnancy trials or whatnot. Okay. Uh, so Franz, the stage is yours. Thanks a lot. Uh, wait. Give me a second. Um, can you see my slides? No, yes. Okay, because it's always <laughs> tricky if switching from one system to another one. So many thanks, uh, Martin, for the kind invitation to present today. Uh, my background is I'm a medical statistician at the Medical University of Vienna. And before I was also working as a statistician at the European Medicines Agency. So this means I'm not really familiar with medical devices, but uh, I'm more in the area of, 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 of uh, drug development and, and, and drugs. Good, and whenever you have a question, simply interrupt me. Uh, yeah, so if you look at classical drug development programs, how do they usually look like? So usually we have a series uh, of several clinical trials uh, conducted in sequential manners up from phase one trials, which are quite small, up to phase three trials. And conventionally, uh, usually at least two phase three trials are conducted and there the company has to demonstrate that their drug is better, for example, than placebo. And usually here it's required by regulators. This is done by a statistical test. And it's a famous, the p-value has to be smaller than 0 0.005. And so if you compare many, many conventional drug uh, development trials, uh, there are many studies in parallel, but each trial stands really on its own feet and each trial is its unique design, and each has its own control, and there's no sharing of control data uh, across trial. So you can argue traditionally, we have learned quite a lot about the control group, about placebo, but less about uh, the treatments it itself. And uh, if we look at these trials uh, here, I said, Regulators especially care about the phase three trials and they care really about that the false positive rate is kept small. So the false positive rate is that we say a treatment is better than placebo when it is actually not. So if you look at the guidelines, the guidelines more or less discuss that, that each trial for it is more or less a standalone one, but don't discuss it in, in, in the overall context. And then, as we have done so for now 20, 30, 40 years, the question become, why do we need to, be, why do we want something else? And I think it becomes quite obvious because standalone RCTs each needs its own control group. So it is really an inefficient use of resources. And each time to have, you have to develop the protocol, their own statistical analysis plan, 
you have to get ethics approval. If you want to change something, you have to go back, make amendments. It can cost time whenever you open a new trial site and so on. And especially in the context of personalized medicine, we have a huge amount of hypotheses to be tested. And there, some people say, RCTs have now become the bottleneck of clinical development because they react quite slowly to the incoming data. But how uh, does human nature act when we have incoming data? We want to learn from it as quickly as possible. But the traditional way how trials have been performed is like this three little monkeys. It means we plan the trial and then we have to wait to the very, very end. It, and like in oncology, it can take sometimes four, five, six, seven, eight years until the final trial results come in. So it's like this really monkeys where you close the eyes, ears, and the mouth until the final data come in. And this is not really satisfying. And especially in uh, areas where we have a high medical need, like for the last two years, uh, when we talk about COVID, we want to learn as quickly and adapt our strategy when we see something works or doesn't work. So how can we compare classical clinical trials with what we call adaptive clinical trials. So in classical clinical trials, all the details of the design and analysis has to be prefixed in advance. So which population we're interested in, what is the treatment, what is it exactly the dose, what are the primary and secondary endpoints, analysis strategies, the sample size. And there's really a lack of flexibility to react to any new information which arises either from inside the trials, so from the data we collect, but also from outside the trials. So if new, if other groups publish papers, uh, conduct trials, and flexible or adaptive de designs, now they really al allow for mid-trial design modification based on all information you have gathered so far. So you can really react to, to the incoming data. But as said before, uh, regulators are quite concerned to approve a drug when it doesn't work. So they really care about controlling the type one error rate. And this adaptive design methodology really ensures that you control the type one error rate regardless which design modifications you conduct. Because at the end of the day, you don't want to, to say too easily something works when it doesn't, because it would mean that in the future patients are treated with an inefficient drug. So when we talk about adaptive design, which are the adaptations which are of most interest in drug development. So initially, people cared really about the sample size reassessment. What does it mean? So traditionally, you would have done one power calculation at the very beginning of the trial where you said, OK, I need 100, I need 500, I need 1,000 patients to uh, answer my research question. But however, to do a sample size calculation, you have to make a quite, a quite good guess on what effect you expect what's the variability in the study population of interest. And sometimes it's quite tricky and the assumption might not be very reasonable. And especially if you see that you have a higher variability than anticipated in the planning phase, then you know you would have an underbought study and you would like to increase the sample size. And so uh, adaptive design methodology now allows to increase or decrease the sample size depending on the incoming data. There are also other types of adaptations like uh, changing the population, meaning you have an overall study population or a subgroup. And in the interim analysis, you decide whether to stay with the overall population or just to focus on a subgroup where you see a larger treatment effect. And what also becomes more and more popular are uh, uh, designs where you select the more promising treatment arms at an interim analysis and you crop the treatment arms, which are less promising. So the data I show here are from a review of uh, procedures submitted to the European medicines agencies, where they commented on uh, proposals of companies uh, which uh, wanted to perform adaptive designs. And on the right-hand side, you can see uh, what were the concerns of regulators? So sometimes, and that's a problem, you sometimes see that people are just keen on implementing new methodology when it's not worse is, and they don't give a good justification why new methods are needed. Also, uh, adaptive design can introduce bias. 
for example, in the design where you select the better treatment arms, it could be that when you select the more promising one, that you have a bias in the treatment uh, effect estimate. And then the question becomes, how do I adjust for this potential bias? And especially uh, the type one error was one of the main concerns. And also that people proposed uh, too many interim analysis. And now it's a common standard if we talk about adaptive design that the ad adaptation should be kept to a minimum. And ideally, you would only have one adaptive interim analysis where you really change uh, some of the design features. So here I just want to illustrate how an adaptive seamless design with strip and selection could look like. So this is a picture how drug development uh, works traditionally. So you would have a phase two clinical trial where you could have several dose groups, for example, ABCD and control. And after you have finished the phase two trial, then you would sit down, analyze the data, and then decide, okay, which dose should be carried over to the next phase, to the phase three. And then you would uh, conduct uh, another phase three trial just with the selected treatment arm and the control group. And adaptive, seamless design now combine everything now into a single trial. And you can see now we have an interim analysis where we select some more promising treatment arm or where we drop the unsafe treatment arm. And to gain efficiency now, also the a statistical test is then performed using all the data we have gathered. Because before, in the phase three, we were only allowed to use the data coming from phase three. But with adaptive designs with treatment selection, we would use all the data we have collected for a joint decision making. So hopefully, this will really help to save sample sizes and also help to save time because the preparation time for a second trial is spared. So that's the advantages of adaptive designs. However, it also has to be noted that in the planning phase of a, such an adaptive seamless design, it may take more time ahead compared to the traditional ones, because here on the left hand side, when planning the first stage, you might need a little bit more time. And just to give you an impression how long it can sometimes take until new methodology is really uh, implemented in clinical trial and then also well accepted by regulated, re regulators. So one of the first papers uh, published in adaptive design was in 1989 by Peter Bauer and his seminal work was called multi-stage testing with an adaptive design. And his work was triggered uh, to his uh, membership in an ethics committee and how amendments were handled in the statistic anal analysis uh, and at this days, so more or less the adaptations were completely ignored and people don't care whether the type one error rate is inflated or whether bias is introduced by, by this type of amendments. And in the beginning here in Europe, adaptive dis designs were considered as a kind of absurdity of the German speaking countries and of academia. So it was uh, firstly developed in, in Cologne. But when companies uh, realized that this adaptive design can increase uh, the efficiency of conducting clinical trials, they became more and more interested. And when companies became more interested, also regulators had to react. And you can see that in 2007, a CMA issued a reflection paper. And this was really a, a booster for implementing this type of designs become, because then more and more people realized, okay, regulators are open to discuss new innovative trial designs. And then you can see also on the other side of the ocean, the uh, FDA followed and uh, issued uh, three different uh, guidance documents on adaptive designs. And now we're in the phase where um, the regulators worldwide um, are writing a consolidated guidance under the umbrella of the ICH, so it's the International Conference of Harmonization, where FDA, EMA, I think also the MHA, uh, Health Canada, and other uh, regulators uh, jointly write clinic guidance documents. 
Today, I will spare you with details on the, on the statistical methodology. So if you want to learn more about how to implement uh, adaptive designs in your dry designs, you may have a look at the 20, 25 years paper where most of the relevant uh, literature should be cited. Good. And also, if you want to know more on how regulators uh, see this type of designs and which uh, adaptive designs were already submitted uh, to, to, to the EMA, here you can see two papers. So the left one uh, is on scientific advice letters and the other one is on actually conducted adaptive designs who have been ravaged by the EMA. Good. Nowadays, um, many trials design became popular under the term master protocols. And I just want to give you a very rough overview uh, on this type of designs. And you might have a look at the wonderful paper of Woodcock and, and Lavange, uh, having been published in 2017. And they distinguish three main type of, of, of trial designs. So one is called basket trial, and it means you have one investigational treatment, which is evaluated in the context of multiple diseases or disease types with a common therapeutic target. And then the idea is when you do the analysis, you might uh, gain power by using the data from other disease types. So especially rare disease, it might be quite useful when you can uh, gain uh, power by using also the data from disease two, three, and four for uh, disease one. Vice versa, uh, an umbrella trial is now a trial where you have multiple investigational treatments, uh, which are evaluated in the context of a single disease, possibly with in, in several sub-studies for different disease subtypes. And platform trials are the combination thereof, where you have several drugs which may enter or leave the trial at any point in time. And so you have different disease subtypes, different treatments, and they're really quite flexible because now new treatments can go into the trial whenever they become available. And you can see on this slide, so this type of designs, they can, be, can become quite tricky as far as the statistical analysis and design is concerned, because you might start with several treatment arms in the beginning, then you might have several uh, interim analysis where you adapt your design, like here, you might use a response adaptive allocation ratio, which means that depending on the incoming data, you might, might change the allocation ratio and increase the probability uh, to be randomized into the group, which has a higher efficacy. So it's also attractive for patients because you know they will have a higher chance to get a treatment which might work better. And this type of designs are also quite efficient because now you can really share the control arm data. So you don't need uh, an own control group for each of the treatment arms. And later on, when new treatments become available, you might add even new uh, treatments or new doses. And you might immediately realize this type of designs is quite attractive, especially in the COVID situation, as I will show on the next slide. And also uh, for some of the long-standing platform trials, uh, it's also possible that you might change the control group. So if you start, with, let's say, with a placebo group, and then you realize, OK, treatment one is very efficacious, then it might be unethical to randomize patients to the uh, placebo control any longer. And you might even switch the control group uh, during the conduct of the trial. So what are the advantages of such platform trials? So more patients are eligible for trial due to multiple treatments and sub-studies with possibly even different inclusion criteria. And you build up a joint trial infrastructure, which really leads to saving in time and money for sponsors, because you don't have to reinvent the wheel again and again when you start a new trial. 
And from a statistical point of view, you can test multiple hypotheses within the same trial, which on the other hand is also a big challenge as far as multiplicity is concerned. You can share the control group data and in the context of HDA assessments, now you also have a direct comparison of experimental treatment arms. So you don't have to conduct meta-analysis later on where you compare different experimental treatments because now you have the active treatments from several companies in the same platform trial, which also allows a direct comparison and to assess which treatment is really the better one. However, really, you really have to be careful how you implement it because there's also some work on if you do it naively, how the type one is inflated, like even in the a situation where you just conduct a, a two arm trial and you naively just change the sample size, the type one is not any longer controlled by 2.5%, but already 6%. And if you start with a, a, a platform trial where you have two experimental treatment and a control group, and you allow just to select the better one in the interim, and you also change the location ratio and you change the sample size, since the type 1 error rate is not 2.5, but could be increased up to 17% if you do it naively. So if you would just pull the data and conduct the frequency test and the p-value in SPSS or SAS or R, like you are used to do it in a clinical trial uh, without any correction, then you have a huge type 1 error inflation. So you really have to apply uh, the correct statistical methodology. And here, I've seen before that uh, someone also uh, was online from the University of Oxford. I think this is one of the most impressive scientific stories uh, COVID has shown. So the recovery trial, uh, which was organized by the University of Oxford, which was set up, I think, within two or three weeks in the beginning of the COVID. And they are now testing one treatment after another one. And they have already included above uh, 40 5,000 patients. So this is an impressive, impressive uh, su uh, success story. Uh, and this platform trial really allowed to uh, test which treatments are if efficacious. Some of them are shown on the left hand side, and also to drop treatment arms where the drugs didn't do what people thought they will do. And here, just another example of a platform trial which has been running now for over 12 years in the oncology setting. And here you can see that whenever a new treatment became available, it could quite easily enter the trial. And uh, also to address the flexibility in this type of trials, uh, mainly Bayesian methods are used for the analysis. So if you're also interested in conducting such a trial, you're not left alone when you have to write up your final summary report, because now there are also concert statement uh, uh, on the consort web, web page uh, on how you should report such, this type of trial. And linked uh, to the consort statement, there are also explanatory documents where you can really find uh, case studies of such adaptive designs where you can see how it's implemented and how it's then described uh, correctly. Good. That's more or less all I wanted to say. So please keep you open-minded and also try not only your new methods, but also new statistical methodology and make regulators aware of your new methods as soon as possible. Like uh, here, uh, I also included a link to the EMA EMA's regulatory science initiative. So the EMA has now published a long list of uh, open topics as far as regulatory, regulatory science is concerned. And maybe it's possible for you to link one of your research projects to one of the open issues the EMA has raised. And as we have seen just a video before, here are also some YouTube videos coming out of other EU projects where you can learn more about statistical methodology. Good, that's more or less all I wanted to say, and I hand back to Professor Daumer. Okay, so thank you very much for this remarkable overview that somehow uh, it was possible because you have these two heads on your head, 
uh, or head, I don't know. Uh, so one having been on the side of the regulators, on the other hand, now being in an academic environment, and that is a, is a, is a very special view. And you mentioned initially, well, that you have uh, no experience with medical devices, and this is about drug development. So that's exactly the reason why I've picked you, because the, the, there, is a, there is a change in, 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 in Europe about the, the regulatory path for medical devices that is going to be dramatic, has been triggered by actually a scandal by breast implants with, with uh, bad silicone. And uh, it's, it's, it's now the NDR transition process that is going to be very hard for lots of companies. And uh, so therefore, uh, in order to be innovative in this field, one better learns from medical device um, uh, or trial is innovative trial design because that can be very powerful for medical device trials that will be mandatory in the future. Yeah? And so from that point of view, you have shown us a, a, a whole bundle of, of, of topics that can be adopted for medical devices. And, um, and I agree with you that what we've seen from, from the UK also, of course, from, 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 from Denmark or Sweden, uh, as a response to, to COVID with these innovative trial designs, also for COVID risk factors and so on, is, is outstanding. And, and, and here also Germany and many other countries benefit actually from what has been done in, in these other countries. And uh, so, so from that point of view, perfect. So thanks a lot for, for having shown this and shared this. And hopefully if, if some networking goes on after this meeting and people need a biostatistical support, well, um, I, I would know the email address. Uh, okay, now any, any other questions or comments? I know we, we, we are running a little, a little out of time, but um, uh, I, I, I still, I, I'm sure that we, um, as, as one student group at least, it's dropped off. We, we, we are still more or less on track. So any other comments or questions about the, the last talk? Okay, so then 